As the world around us grows darker and darker in these last days, now's not the time to fold up shop and just hide away. Now's the time to tell people about Jesus and to stand on the truth of His Word. He has a plan for our future, and we're going to learn how we can thrive in these perilous times. That's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. Thank you for joining us this week as I've been teaching from my book, How to Thrive in Perilous Times. And I want to encourage you to get your copy. I'll tell you at the end how you can do that. It's only $5, but it'd be a very beneficial uh, book in your library. We are in perilous times. The Bible says we are. And yet we can live and thrive in perilous times, not just survive. And we're talking about the four uh, things that the Bible tells us to, th to do to thrive in perilous times. First one was make sure you're not deceived uh, and don't be troubled. <laughs> and yesterday I was, I was trying to make a point about the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached. How, how do we get ready? How do we get busy? How, now is not the time for you to be ordering tribulation food and a power generator and uh, eggs that are powdered in the last 12 years. That, that's, that's not for you as a Christian. That's not for the church. Excuse me. The church is, is going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air before the great tribulation period comes. Now, I know we have ministers in America, even on VTN. I heard one of them the other day. They said that this business of a secret rapture is, is pure nonsense. Well, they can stay if they want to. But it's, it's not pure nonsense. It's the Word of God. It all depends on how you interpret the Scripture. And uh, I would encourage you to find out for yourself. Don't take my word for it or their word. But now's not the time for, for retreat. You know, the Scripture we read um, in Timothy said to endure hardness as a good soldier. Well, I've been a soldier. I've been a sailor. I've been in combat. I've been in uh, areas where you were threatened, your life was threatened, you've, uh, you know, we were in our 5-inch 38 gun mounts shelling the islands in Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, the Bay of Pigs. We were down there uh, supporting uh, the Marines that were dug in. I mean, we were ready to blow that piece of country, that real estate, off the face of the map. And when the shooting started, you had to rely on your, your training, you had to rely on your commander-in-chief, you had to rely on your a gunner's mate who's directing our, our firepower. But when we were at wartime alert and general quarters, there was nothing about uh, uh, hiding. There was nothing about retreat. There was nothing about uh, giving up. It was about charge. It, it was about firepower. It was about uh, <laughs> defeating the enemy. Uh, there was nothing about retreat. We didn't, we didn't have any retreat plan. And a good soldier, you know, is motivated to charge with bayonet fixed in hand. We never even dreamed. Of course, we were only 20 years old. We never dreamed that, you know, uh, we could die. You know, we never, you know, that didn't enter your mind. We were stupid. We were young and thought we were invincible. But your, your attitude is not one of retreat. Your attitude is one of victory. I mean, you know, when we celebrate these heroic days of our military and our armed services and D-Day and uh, Veterans Day and Memorial Day and all these things, we see these young men, 20 years old. My father was 20 when he went into World War II. He was 20, uh, 20 years old. And, I mean, we see these kids just climbing up cliffs and uh, the, the enemy shooting at them and throwing grenades and bombs and mortars and they died by the tens of thousands. And yet when General George Patton wrote his book on leadership, I have copies of all the major leaders in our country, both political and military, and George Patton taught his troops. He taught them to run or jog, carrying, firing their rifles, they could cover a mile in 30 minutes, shooting and firing their rifles. He said, you never let your enemy know where you are. 
He said, to dig a foxhole is to dig your grave. He said, you keep moving. Even, even uh, athletic trainers, physical trainers will tell you, if you want to live and get maximum life out of your physical body, you got to keep it moving. The minute you sit down on the couch and say, I'm done, I'm here for whatever, it won't be long. You got to get up. You got to move. Well, it's the same spiritually uh, <laughs> where thriving in perilous times is concerned. You got to get ready. You got to get busy. And I was commenting on this yesterday when we closed. You've got to stand up and speak for what's right in elections, in community meetings, in um, your, your church, pastors. You can't be afraid and intimidated by the congregation or by the government. You have to get up and speak what's right. And, and believers, church members, people that are people of faith, born again, you've got to, you've got to speak the truth. You've got to stand up. You've got to go to the voting booth. You've got to say, no, we're not going to have this lottery. We're not going to have this casino. No, we're not going to have this medical marijuana. No, we're not going to have uh, homosexuality. We're not going to have these things. And you put people in office that believe that way. And listen, the only reason we have these things going on right now is because the believers, the church people did not vote or else they whimped out and voted uh, in favor of these things. So you've got to get up. You've got to preach the gospel to every creature. You've got to let your, your uh, voice be heard. You've got to stand up. If, if everybody that is a truly born again Christian. Now, cause you got to understand that the, the pop culture of the millennial crowd, these, these young people that don't know what the scripture says and don't know the history of America, they're going to believe somebody uh, that comes along as a socialist and say, Oh, we're going to, we're going to make education free in this land. We're going to cancel your school debt, blah, 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 blah. We're going to give you everything you need. You know, that's uh, Franklin Roosevelt's the one that started all this entitlement business. And for good reason, after World War II and the GIs were coming home and he said, we're going to put a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Hey, let's vote for this guy. <laughs> but what happened was, and he did a lot of good in putting people to work, the, uh, the WPA, the, uh, the people that built War Memorial Stadium uh, here in central Arkansas, uh, the people that built the bridges and the public buildings. He put them to work. But what they forgot to do is cancel all of the entitlement programs after they'd fulfilled their objective. What we did is we just kept the entitlement mentality and just passed it on generation to generation to generation. Now nobody wants to work. They want everything given to them. I, and, you know, I think about, um, and, and legitimately so and understandably so, kids that want to go to college, and they, they borrow up to the hilt or their parents borrow up to the hilts. And then when they get out, they've got all this huge, humongous debt to pay. But I've also heard and seen testimonies of people. And this is the, was, this is the way it was in, in my day when I went to school that would get a job and they would work and they'd pay their own tuition. They'd work every night. They'd work on the weekends, make money and pay their tuition. I mean, wonderful if you have parents that can afford to pay. My father told me, he said, you and your sister going to school about the same time, two years apart. He said, I've worked and saved to pay for your education. If you don't go now, told, told me this. He said, if you don't go now, when he was ready to send me, he said, your sister's two years behind you and I won't have the money to pay for both of you. So you better go now. I mean, he'd plan this out. Praise God. But there are families that haven't and can't. And I've seen kids work their way through college. My uncle, my father's oldest brother, wound up a Ph.D. in chemistry, president and CEO of National Starch and Chemical Company, a large chemical company in New York City. He lived to be 103, died a multimillionaire, several patents and so forth. He, he worked all the way through college. He, he, my nephew, my sister's son, now he and his wife are both doctors, but they were smart when they got out of college and out of medical school and started their practices. One's a gynecologist, one's an ER doctor. Once they started their practice, 
they made a decision. We're not going to buy a house or a car or any major purchases until we get our college debt paid off. So all of their monies for the first several years of their practices went to pay their college debt. And then after they paid off their debts, then and only did, then did they buy a house and a car. So you, there are ways to, to, to uh, slay these giants, but just looking for a handout, gimme, 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 that's not going to cut it. And you shouldn't vote for people that promise you all of that. Because where are they going to get the money? They're going to tax somebody. They're going to tax you. <laughs> They're going to rob from Peter to pay Paul. Uh, you, you just need to do it the God, godly way, the Bible way. And when you find that these immoral uh, and sometimes illegal uh, things are presented to the public, you, you need to vote according to the Bible. And you need to tell people why. Tell people what's going on. We could have prevented the lottery, the casinos, but the people in those counties wanted those casinos. So that means when you want that casino and you get the casino, then you have willingly agreed to accept everything that goes along with it. The mob, the gangs, the murder, rape, robbery, the stealing. When, when you vote for the lottery, you, you, you know, you believe what you were told that it was going to fund uh, college education. Only 18% of it goes to fund college education. You, you were lied to. You were manipulated. You, you, they used you. But where were all the people that knew better? Where were all the Christians? Asleep? In church? Those days are over. You're going to have to stand up or you're going to have a socialist country. You're going to have a socialist nation run by socialists, and the same results as has happened to all other socialist countries in history. And then you'll be responsible. You'll be responsible for a socialist nation that has no electricity, can't pay its bills, has no money. Everybody's living off the government. If that's what you want, then vote that way. And then you'll have to live with it. You'll have to live with the crime that comes along with the lotteries, the casinos, and the medical marijuana. Because you know good and well, all that marijuana that's grown is not going to be limited to just medical uses. Besides, there's, there's no substantial evidence that, and, and we had doctors tell us this when they were trying to sell the medical marijuana to the people. There are doctors that told you that medical marijuana has no substantial track record. I mean, Colorado sent doctors and nurses and, and police officers down here to Arkansas to tell us, don't do this. Their crime rate has, and automobile accidents have multiplied five times what they were. So, you know, if, if that's what you want, but spare the rest of us. If that's what you want, then move to Venezuela. Move to Russia, move to some place that's already using. Seventy years of communism produced zero. The Soviet bloc countries. Right? Go over there to Russia and find out. There's no benefit to communism. Madeleine Murray O'Hare, remember her? She was instrumental in getting prayer taken out of school in the 60s. She was going to move to Russia. And she went over there and tried to become a Russian citizen. And when the, this is a paraphrase of the story. When she went over there and they interviewed her and, and, and noticed that she had no visible means of support, she had no profession, no job, no nothing, they wouldn't let her in. They refused her. They said, you wouldn't survive over here because everybody has to work. Why? Everybody works for the good of the, of the nation, for the good of Mother Russia. But they don't get their, they don't get their, the results of their working. It all goes to be distributed among all the people. I asked a young man that had picked me up at the airport in Sweden. We had a church in Sweden and I went over there to preach in it. And so this young man picked me up at the airport, took me, and then took me back to the airport a few days later. 
And so I asked, and Sweden's a socialist country. And so I asked him, I said, well, how, how is everything here in Sweden? He said, oh, it's wonderful. He, now he's 18, 19 years old, 20 years, maybe 21. Oh, it's wonderful. I said, I, I, I explained that to me. What do you mean? He said, oh, the government pays for everything. Government pays for uh, all of our health care, medication, surgeries, everything. I said, uh, you mean it's all free? He said, yeah, it's all free. I said, how much income tax do you pay? <laughs> oh, at that time, I think they were paying 20 or 30% of their income, maybe less, in income tax. So it's not free. You're paying for it. They're, they're taking your money and giving it to somebody else that doesn't have any money. Now, that's fine if you want to do that, if you can do that and you want to do that. But it's not fine when the government forces you to do that. And that's what socialism is all about. So you have to speak up, stand up, speak up. Abortion kills 60 million babies in America. Whew. If America ever does go down the tubes, that'll be the main reason. We've killed 60 million babies in the womb. You can't look down your nose at, at historic nations that did child sacrifice. We're doing the same thing. And the Bible says you reap what you sow. It's not God. It's not God that's going to judge America. America judges herself when she commits these sins and atrocities. And the Bible says don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So you have to stand up, speak up, preach the gospel. You have to go down and vote. You have to let your voice be heard. You have to, to preach the gospel of the kingdom as a good soldier. Okay. Um, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I was over there a while ago. I did not mark my place, but I think I can find it here. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and let's look at... Uh, verse 4. Ecclesiastes 1, 4. One generation passes away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. When Jesus said the end shall come, he's not talking about the end of the world or the end of the earth. The Bible says heaven and earth uh, will pass away, but my word will never pass away. When he talks about passing away, he's really referring to change. Heaven and earth will change, but my word will never change. And the earth is never going away. The earth is never coming to an end. When Jesus said the end shall come in these last days, the, the end, he's talking about the end of the church age. This period of 2,000 years that we know as believers from the time of Christ till now, approximately 2,000 years. Now, if you use the Hebrew calendar, it's different, but approximately 2,000 years. This, this age, when you come to the end of this age, the end of this age, not the end of the world, not the end of the earth. So we're at the end of that age right now. Oh, there may be a little sliver of time, a little window of, of uh, you know, grace, but this particular age in God's plan for things is coming to an end. And when it does, then the great tribulation is going to take place and everybody that has not received Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, the church will already be raptured out, caught out, but everybody goes into the um, Great Tribulation where the wrath of God is poured out, where Antichrist, the beast system, the false prophet all are operating, and people are screaming out, they can't buy or sell, blah, 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 and everything that happens in that time period. While the church is in the heavens receiving the judgment seat of Christ, rewards for what they've done in the body of Christ and enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. That age begins to, to begin. That, that millennial dispensation begins. So where are, you going to, where are you going to spend that seven years of great tribulation? 
if it's on the earth, you'll either have to be martyred to survive. I know that sounds contradictory, but you'll have to be martyred uh, to survive. If you take the mark of the beast, you're done for. There's no forgiveness. You know, there's no uh, anything for you. You're, you're done since you're settled home. But if you're martyred, you'll be resurrected. You'll be raised. All those that were born during that great tribulation period will have to make a decision for Christ because Satan will be loose for a season and you have to make a decision for Jesus because, you know, you're going to, I mean, I'm excuse, excuse me, I'm sorry, at the end of the millennial reign, you'll have to make a decision for Christ. You go in, you'll go right from the great tribulation into the millennial reign. Jesus is going to rule for a thousand years. The end of that thousand years, Satan's loosed and you have to make a decision for Jesus because you've not been tempted for a thousand years. The devil's been bound. I mean, all these things are going to come to pass, whether you believe it or not, or whether you're aware of it or not. So I want to make you aware of it. How are you going to face the future? How are you going to live, thrive in victory? How are you going to make it through the end of the age, ready for the rapture, ready for the second coming of Christ, avoid the great tribulation period, and go into the millennial reign. Now, the millennial reign is not the end. After the millennial reign is the dispensation of the redeemed. That's where you and me and all other believers rule the new creation. See, God's going to renovate this earth. Now, I know I'm getting off into stuff that doesn't really apply to these last days, but God's going to renovate the earth. Uh, the heaven, God, where God lives now, third heaven's going to move. Uh, the bride the, of the Lamb, the new city of Jerusalem, is going to move to this renovated earth. And it's going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. God's plan that He devised in the beginning for the relationship between He and man has not changed God's plan for the ages has not changed. It was just delayed a few thousand years. <laughs> so we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of God's plan into the garden atmosphere where we're going to rule and reign and have dominion with Christ for eternity. Hallelujah. Okay, let me go on. I think... Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, okay, we've got about four and a half minutes. Um, let me go to uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, and let me look at verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And I've read you all of the character issues, uh, but let's, let's expand on this just a minute. The last days, the end of this dispensation, the church age, the gospel age, a time of danger to the faith of God's people. And you know what Satan is after? He's after destroying your faith. He's after your faith. He wants to, that's what the parable of the sower is, is all about. He's, he's trying to stop you from believing the word of God. So these perilous times, these last days, are a time of danger to your faith, the faith of God's people. Now, let's go over to Jude and let's see what he said <clears throat> that we were to do about that during this time. Jude 3 now, there are only, there's only uh, one chapter, so it's Jude 1, 3, third verse of Jude. And, um, well, yeah, let me, let me read. Yeah, I, I got it. I have it written, <laughs> written down wrong. Let me read Jude 3, and, um, and then we'll pick this up here tomorrow. 
Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So we're in this period, this, these last days, we're, we're in these perilous times, times of danger to our faith, troubled times, and the church has been guilty of being dumbed down. We don't teach strong faith anymore. We've been reduced to events and special this and special that, and, and we don't get a steady diet of the Word of God, and especially faith. But it's, uh, he goes on to say, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go over to verse 17. But beloved, remember the words which are spoken before of the apostles of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own ungodly lust. These be that were separate, they separated themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. Now he's warning the church. Jude is warning the church of this particular time and the danger therein. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life, and some having compassion, making a difference. Now we'll pick this up tomorrow and continue with this as we close out this study on how to thrive in perilous times. Remind yourself of these scriptures. Now we're going we're gonna to pick this up tomorrow. What do you do? How do you face the future with confidence, faith, and victory instead of being afraid, fearful? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, don't forget to order your copy of the book. The information is on the screen um, and you can get it uh, as soon as we hear from you. Remember Jesus is Lord over Arkansas and wherever you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.